Uh, Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon to ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure on behalf of uh, Gallup Pakistan and World Justice Project to uh, welcome you at the Rule of Law report and a discussion on rule, rule of law in Pakistan. Uh, my name is Bilal uh, Gilani. I am the Executive Director at Gallup Pakistan. Um, and I've been involved with the World Justice Project, uh, different studies for three to four years. We also have on, our, on the line, uh, on the phone, Dr. Uh, Alejandro Ponce, uh, who is the, uh, the data scientist at, uh, and the head of the methodology at World Justice Project. Uh, he would also be joining us on Skype uh, uh, in the near future. Uh, the basic purpose of the, today's session is both to unveil the findings of the World Justice Project report on Pakistan, uh, but largely it is also to create a community of people who are working on uh, different aspects of rule of law. So uh, we have today a very distinguished gathering of uh, people who are involved as practitioners of law, people who are public policy experts, people from the donor community, uh, people uh, from the research institutions like Gallup and others. Um, who, all of us have a common interest in uh, improvement of rule of law in the country. So one of the purposes is to share the findings and the other is to create a community of people who could talk to each other and help us understand what other uh, research projects are happening, uh, what initiatives are being taken in the sphere of rule of law. So in order to uh, uh, proceed further, we may start from introductions from each of the participants so that we are able to understand who is here. So we could start with here. Um, I am Rashid Kasmi. Uh, I am Technical Advisor, GIZ. GIZ is a German International Development Agency based at in Islamabad. So we are working on the rule of law um, in Punjab and Sindh. So we have been engaged in rule of law since last five, six years. <coughs> I'm, uh, I'm looking after the peace program of uh, UNODC, United Nations Office on Drug and Crime, uh, working in uh, currently in two provinces, Balochistan uh, for rule of law and uh, Punjab partially in one uh, region that is Gujranwala for rule of law. I'm Jen Garistan. I'm uh, the technical director for Accountable Justice Program, Pakistan. Uh, we're still in our inception period, so trying to figure out where we are going to um, implement and, and exactly how. So, I'll see you here, so we to be new technique. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tom Howe. I'm the Human Rights Officer in the British High Commission. Uh, we have a very broad interest in uniform access to justice um, issues and work closely with um, Jenny and, and others. So, it's uh, very useful to be here to uh, meet all of you. Good afternoon, thank you for inviting me as well. I'm in a town, I'm working for the European Union and I'm a carbon carbonist as well. I cover portfolio, human rights, uh, parliament support, and rule of law. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Hadi Aziz. I'm working as a practitioner of law and advocate high school in Islamabad and I'm also a state council that's a criminal prosecutor at Islamabad. My name is Tanvir Islam. I'm Advocate Supreme Court. And currently, I'm working with Kundi and Kundi Law Associates and one of their associates. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Afnan Karim Kundi. I'm an Advocate Supreme Court. Presently, I'm also a Russian Attorney General of Pakistan at Islamabad High Court. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm Ashul Asar. I'm currently associated with Kundi and Kundi. I'm an Advocate for the District Courts. Assalamu alaikum everyone, my name is Obeis Anwar. I'm Director of the Conflict Law Center at the Research Society of International Law. Um, at the Conflict Law Center, our primary focus is the law of armed conflict and how it applies to Pakistan. Um, that becomes quite tricky because uh, uh, it's not a very clear-cut uh, issue there. So we look at a lot of issues such as uh, counter-terrorism, uh, militancy in Fata, militancy in Balochistan, and that's what we're examining these days. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Ahmed Hamza Ghazali, an Africa High School, currently associated with Kundi and Kundi. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Dawood Iqbal and I'm currently working with Kumi and Kumi. My name is Adnan Rafiq. I uh, recently completed a PhD thesis on judicial independence in Pakistan. And I'm also director of the Oxford Institute, under which we 
do research in the development and social sector. Uh, my name is Sherya. Uh, I'm also working as a director at uh, Oxford Institute. I mainly handle research, monitoring, and evaluation. And currently, we are working on various themes in uh, countering violent extremism in the youth of Pakistan. So, I'm, um, my name is Ali Ben. I'm practicing lawyer at uh, Salman High School. Uh, my name is Yasir Ati Hamdani. I'm an advocate of the High Court and I practice in Islamabad and sometimes in Lahore as well. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Baba Madhav and uh, I am an advocate at Kurt Yorki with two different editors. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Malik Sanab. I'm an advocate at High Court. I'm an assistant district public prosecutor in uh, District Attorney. Uh, my primary job is to those people who don't believe in rule of law, and I'm trying my best. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Yah Hashmi. I'm an independent consultant, currently working as a gender and rule of law consultant for women and women, United Nations entity for women and women, uh, as part of the Lojistan rule of law roadmap. I'm Amitpur, I'm Anyam and I'm assistant manager at Gaspar. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Mudassir al -Kaf, and I'm working in Reclamation and Probation Department as Probation Officer Lahore. Hi everyone, my name is Umair Ahmed. I am working as a Parole Officer in Reclamation and Probation Department in, in Punjab government. And we are providing rehabilitation and correctional services to the offenders who are released on parole and probation. Ijaz Gilani, I'm uh, the non-executive chairman of Gallup Pakistan and also teach uh, politics and international relations at various universities in Islamabad these days. Thank you so much for the introduction. I uh, invite Dr. Gilani to make a short presentation on his understanding of the rule of law and the World Justice Program. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Um, in fact, uh, Bilal and Omar asked me uh, not to speak about the data. <laughs> there was a clear instruction in the sense, and since I'm a non-executive chairman, I have to follow what the institution tells me about. So I've given some more general remarks, uh, some about the group as such. Gallup Pakistan, the name does not suggest much of a research in the field of law or rule of law. It is generally more known in the marketing research or in opinion polling and so on and so forth. But for the last few years, uh, Gallup Pakistan has been participating, I think it should be perhaps the seventh or the eighth year, in a global study which is on rule of law index. And that is what brought me also personally in contact with people like Dr. Alejandro Ponce, who will be soon be speaking to us on the Skype. Uh, and I began to realize that there is some relationship between the kind of work that we do and other professions which are present here. Because as we saw from the introductions, there was quite a variety of professions uh, represented around this table. Some from the government is here, some from the practicing legal community, others from the research community, still others from donors might be a wrong name, perhaps the international public policy community. Uh, so uh, this combination, all of them in some sense uh, have a common task, but the judicial and legal community, politics and governance community and where we might place the Gallup Pakistan would perhaps be the data scientists community. The data scientists in terms of, as I will soon uh, come to, uh, perceptions as well as other forms of interactions. Next. And over the years, uh, in both my research and teaching career, I've realized that it is discourse often across disciplinary communities. In the academia, we focus very much on a single discipline, but in practice and in action, that cuts across disciplines. So law meets politics, and politics meet, meets economics, and both of them perhaps meet governance, 
and all of them meet with data and data analysis. So it is discourse across disciplinary boundaries which generates knowledge. We often say that's what information should be. Which generates knowledge, uh, insights, and action. So that's one reason that the discourse across these to generate knowledge, insights, and action. Next, please. While the data in itself is often, sometimes, if not often, lifeless, simple numbers, it is the discourse I've realized helps to weave a story. Because the story is a whole. Data from any one discipline uh, is only a part. It's like a bone. Uh, but it's the entire story which is weaved through a discourse across disciplines which helps us build a narrative. Next. So I thought since I have very short time, I might pick up some, um, some portions of a very interesting book which is on this subject as a whole and covers a very long period of time, which is from Francis Fukuyama, known for his other work, but this is a more, uh, a much more detailed work, The Origins of Political Order. Because at the end of the day, the rule of law is also a story about order, order of a particular way. And while it's each part of it might be simple, the combination becomes very complex and has many tensions as soon as we begin to think and as soon as we do surveys on it, that the surveys have different aspects and perspectives, sometimes conflicting. Everyone is looking for order, but they're not looking at order from the same perspective or from the same solution. And that generates a lot of tensions. So it is from the book, these are abstracts uh, from the book, there's always a tension between state building and rule of law. And I picked up this portion because it is particularly relevant to a state like Pakistan and many others which have been born after 1945. And here, state building and the rule of the law coexist in a certain tension. That's the story of our 70 years. We want to form a state, but the state sometimes looks at the development of the state from perspectives which may not be coexistent with the rule of law. On the one hand, rulers can enhance their authority by acting within and on behalf of law. We have many from the state here. On the other, the law can prevent them from doing things they would like to do. Because law is also for the state and for the governors of the state not just in their own private interest, but in the interest of the community. That is how state and rulers define their task as a whole. So the rule of law is constantly threatened by the need to generate political power. From 17th century English monarchs who wanted to raise revenues without going through parliament to Latin American governments, that's the example he gives in the 20th 20th century fighting terrorism with extra legal death squads. A story not unknown in Pakistan, where many rulers say that we would like to build a strong state, an effective state, economic development, by killing outside law. We even have Urdu terminology for it. Guess your name? Kya katal karte ho? Mawarai adalat katal. Next, please. So there is a tension between these two. Uh, not yet necessarily rulers think of it as something which is not in the interest of the community, but in fact, in their view, they are breaking law in the interest of the community. Does rule of law mean good governance and does it bring higher growth rates? In states like ours, 
even when we talk about governance, we say it is the same development, it is the, uh, the development proportion donor group to whom we often think that governance will bring higher economic growth and they are related, the development center, the sector and the governance sector are intertwined with each other, again many represented here, who are otherwise known as the development sector. There's a large literature that links the establishment of the rule of law to economic development. This literature reflects an important insight that the emergence of the modern world, including the emergence of a capitalist economy, was broadly dependent on the prior existence of rule of law. The absence of a strong rule of law is indeed one of the principal reasons they think why poor countries cannot achieve higher rates of growth and that those who have higher rates of growth and are rich have rule of law. Next. But this literature, this particular book points out, is highly confused. The one that links directly good governance with higher economic development is highly confused and inconsistent with regard to basic definition of the rule of law and how to measure its presence and absence. What we do is that task, measure its presence and absence. And Bilal will give you the data from Pakistan. But this particular book says that literature is highly confused and inconsistent. The theory that links the different components of the rule of law to economic growth is empirically questionable and becomes doubly so when projected back on societies that existed under scarcity or Malthusian economic conditions before we can proceed with the historical account of the origin of the rule of law we need to clear away some of the baggage left by contemporary discussion on it that regards the two as very consistent with each other. The two sometimes may conflict and therefore present a case of a choice between rule of law and economic growth. Next, please. And some of that tension is not only of recent origin. In fact, the rule of law, as this suggests, is the resistance to godly claims made by kings today called the state. The rule of law is the resistance of the society to godly claims made by the king, say in today's language, the state. The great political struggles of utterly modern Europe, that's what it gives us the background, concerned the rise of monarchs who asserted novel doctrines of sovereignty. That's what I teach in political science and political theory, beginning from Leviathan of Hobbes, which this particular longer period reflection on the subject presents as, comma, as a novel doctrines of sovereignty that place themselves rather than God at the top of the hierarchy. These kings, like the Chinese emperors, asserted that they alone could make law through their positive encroachments and that they were not bound by prior law, custom, or religion. The story of the rise of modern ruler of law concerns the success of resistance to this. So the rule of law has very much a resistance to the godly claims of the kings and states. The story of the right modern is, is a successful resistance of these claims and a reassertion of the primacy of law rather than the primacy of the king or the state. This resistance was obviously made much easier when a religious tradition gave law a sanctity, autonomy, and coherence that it otherwise might not have had. Next, please. But then the book explains that even where religion is not given high degree of importance, 
the discontinuity between medieval and modern rule of law is more apparent than real. Societies that give importance to religion and those which do not. If one understands law as an embodiment of broad social consensus, social consensus regarding rules of justice, and law remains an expression of broadly shared rules of justice, regardless whether it is expressed in religious or in secular terms. I chose this piece in particular because that's where our sociological studies are placed. We're not looking only at the rules written in the books of the states or the kings, but also how society perceives these and what kinds of views and what distribution of views the society, that social consensus mentioned here, has about those particular aspects of life. And that's what brings survey work into the picture. Next, please. The data scientists and pollsters measure what is shared or not shared in the society. I guess I wanted to make this point because that's where the data scientist joins the triangle. Next, please. And I thought I would pick up a piece from there, <coughs> from, which prevents the Montgratian as in his role as a data scientist. Because one of the tasks of a data scientist is opinion polls that we do. But we also then do a lot of empirical work, as I've also personally done, on listing laws, classifying them, grouping them in different ways, or listing and archiving different types of decisions, and so on and so forth. So a big deal of archival work in different traditions, whether in the tradition of hadith, or whether in the tradition of fiqh, or here, as it says, that Mongratian trained in the legal curriculum analyzed thousands of canons issued over the past centuries, and this is in the 12th century. He reconciled and synthesized them, Montgratian, into a single body of canon law. This was published in 1140, 12th century, in a massive legal treatise of some 1400 pages. The Concordance and Discordant Canons, or Thecretium, if that's the right pronunciation. Gratian established a hierarchy among different types of laws and so on. So, the title that, on which I was asked to speak is how empirical research is related to legal research and research in governance, and how this triangle where a data scientist meets with governance researcher and legal researcher gets completed. And I found out that historically, whether it is in terms of documenting laws or documenting precedences or documenting cases, which requires great deal of deal of data science work, and public opinion polling, which finds out what is the social consensus present at a particular stage of society. Next is perhaps the last slide. Thank you very much. I thought I would start with this uh, more general overview, in the light of which we can look at the data in Pakistan. Thank you. Uh, now, I, uh, Dr. Aliandro Ponce would speak. Um, I give a brief introduction to Dr. Aliandro Ponce. Dr. Aliandro Ponce is the Chief Executive Officer of the World Justice Project. He joined WJP as senior economist is, and is one of the original designers and lead author uh, of the World Justice Project reports. Uh, prior to joining uh, the World Justice Project, Dr. Ponce worked as a researcher at Yale University and as an economist at the World Bank and the Mexican Banking and Securities Commission. Uh, go good afternoon, Dr. Ponce. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have you, and the floor is with you now. Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. 
Association um, for the organize, organizing this uh, conference about the, uh, the situation of the rule of law in, in Pakistan. The, I'm going to talk briefly uh, about the origins of this project and uh, uh, just how we have been collecting this information over the years, what the idea behind this information is, as well as how it has been used, and then leave some room to be now to, to present the, the report. Uh, just, so first of all, just uh, the World Justice Project is an organization based in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Uh, we were established in 2008 as part of the American Bar Association. This was a presidential initiative. Uh, and the idea of the organization was to advance the rule of law around the world. So you can imagine that it's a really broad uh, uh, goal. Uh, we have done this through different uh, Projects. The overall idea of the organization is that we cannot do that from Washington, D.C. The rule of law has to be built from within countries. It just has to be measured from each one of the countries and has to be advanced within each one of the countries. The only thing that we do is either amplify the voices of the people or uh, um, engage with people, connect people, uh, just to, to have better discussions and better policies. We never give policy recommendations as such. We are just simply honest brokers of information in which we transmit information that we receive from the public. And that was the idea behind the rule of law index. When we started just uh, the project, we did an exercise to uh, see what was available out there to try to measure the rule of law. Uh, and if we did an exercise, uh, we were able to collect a lot of different indicators and, and at the same time we were building a conceptual framework just uh, taking many of the points that the largest uh, mentioned uh, and uh, really trying to see just how to create a definition of the rule of law uh, that would be applicable to the different societies that was big uh, enough to be meaningful uh, and at the same time that could be measurable. So that were the problems that we had when we started with this project. The, the final outcome was a framework that contains eight factors. And these eight factors embed two ideas. So uh, about the relationship between the state and the government. And this idea, the first one is that the law imposes limits on the exercise of power by the state as well as individuals and private entities. The second is that the state also limits the actions of members of society and fulfills its basic duties towards its population. So what are these basic duties? For example, protecting the public from violence or providing society mechanisms to settle disputes and repair grievances. So those are basic functions that every state in the world has to fulfill. So with that, we came up with a framework uh, that contains eight broad indicators that go from uh, checks and balances, absence of corruption, uh, protection of fundamental rights, open government, which speak about this first idea of the state imposing limits I'm sorry, of the law imposing limits on the on the power of the state or the exercise of power by the state. 
And then some other components which talk about the idea of the state imposing limits on what people can do and uh, fulfilling its basic duties towards its population, which are related to security, uh, are related to regulatory enforcement, and access to justice, and, and an effective criminal justice system. So all these eight factors uh, provide something <coughs> that is a comprehensive view of the rule of law, which uh, separates these uh, set of indicators to other indicators that look at particular elements of the rule of law. Uh, three things that were important when we were developing this framework and later were thinking about how to measure it. So the first one is that it has to be multidimensional. So as I mentioned, it has to include many components. We were not only going to talk about corruption or about access to justice. We needed to talk about all of them. Number two is that these have to be seen from the perspective of the people. So that we, we always uh, hear about a lot of conversations in which uh, there are changes in the laws or changes in institutions, but in many cases these are not reflected uh, or the population doesn't receive the, the changes. Uh, so the idea of the, of the index was this has to be seen from the perspective of the people, how people experience these outcomes, regardless of the institutional structure or the laws in the country, at the end of the day, how it is experienced by the people. And the outcome that people perceive or experience, maybe, maybe framed because of the laws, because of the institutions, because of budget, because of incentives, but at the end of the day, what we wanted was how is this perceived and experienced by the people. So this was important because, uh, number one, just this is what all uh, I mean, the states and people care about, so at the end of the day, how this is translated to the people. But also, from a practical perspective, this allows to compare outcomes across different countries. As you can imagine, just doing an exercise that tries to cover countries from different uh, cultures and institutional settings, it is very difficult to, to try to compare these countries if we go into how countries that they, they just uh, enact laws or the actual laws or the institutions to enforce the laws. So by, by focusing on outcomes, to a certain extent, we sidestep these concerns and we just simply look at, at, at the, the final results. Uh, the third one had to, had to do with uh, the, the approach that we wanted with when communicating the results and when looking at the indicators. Uh, we know that there are very different uh, countries around the world with different levels of development, different geographies. And the last thing that we wanted was to produce an, a, a set of indicators to shame and blame countries. So we wanted to highlight the strengths and weaknesses of each one of the countries, all countries in the world have strengths and weaknesses. We wanted to provide meaningful comparisons of countries. It doesn't make sense to compare Pakistan with Denmark, but it makes sense to compare Pakistan with countries of several levels of development, uh, just to provide more, more meaningful com comparisons. So that was the, the idea of the, the framework that we had uh, when developing the rule of law index. This effort started back in 2008. We started with a few pilots and started expanding the number of countries. We did 35. In the first round, Pakistan was included. We have been working with Gallo Pakistan for many years. And, uh, and we kept expanding over the year to this year that we have included 130 countries. How do we do this in practice? Just overall, each one of the eight indicators are subdivided into four sub-indicators to have 48 indicators. When we talk about justice, we're talking about access to justice, we're talking about 
uh, timeliness in delivering justice. We're talking about the justice system that doesn't have corruption. So different outputs are desirable in a justice system. How do we measure that in practice? Well, what I said at the beginning was that we wanted to focus on the perspective of the people. So the best way to do this is uh, to, on one hand, to ask the people. And that's what we do, so that's why we collect in each country, uh, uh, we, just, we develop a survey uh, just touching on the different topics that I have mentioned, just whether people have had to pay a bribe, or when people have problems, what do they do to try to solve the problems? What is the perception of people when dealing with the police? What is the perception of people about uh, fundamental freedoms, etc.? Uh, so we ask people in each country, uh, we interview a thousand people in the three largest cities, uh, and ask all these questions. These are similar questions in all countries. These are questions that every citizen can answer. Um, and, and with that, we, we, we uh, they collect about 200 variables. Then we supplement that information with information from a uh, service to practitioners. As you can imagine, there are things that people do not know. If we ask people about the performance of the criminal justice system, they don't know. So then we have to ask, uh, people who are working on this on a daily basis, but without losing the perspective of the people. So we ask lawyers, because in many cases, or in most cases, they are the agents of the users of the system. And we ask them not about the laws, but about the experiences and perceptions that they have based on their daily work. We interview lawyers in civil law, criminal law, labor law, and public health. We have a large database that we have collected over the years through different means of lawyers in the different countries, and we invite them to participate on a pro bono basis. Overall, we have about 25 respondents every year in each country, on average. And they provide about 300 variables, uh, just some of these four different questionnaires. So overall, we have about 500 variables that we use to uh, populate the 48 indicators that I mentioned before. Each one of the variables touches on a particular topic of the index or several topics of the index. We uh, generate scores based on these variables. Uh, all the scores are between zero and one, where one is more rule of law. We normalize it and that allows to compare different questions and to generate the scores for each one of the dimensions that we want to measure. Uh, so we do this for all the different countries in the world. So as you can see, the only thing that we do here is collect information. It's, this is not an exercise in which we have experts in the U.S. ranking a particular country. This is just an effort that is done in the country. And just we simply collect information, obviously we check for the validity of the data, we cross-check the results against a lot of different sources, in-country sources and international sources, to finally come up with the scores. We publish the scores, just we publish a global ranking, a regional ranking, an income group ranking, and just the, on the different dimensions to highlight those areas in which the country they are, they have strengths, and the country have weaknesses. Again, our approach is to, to be as, as honest as, as possible. Just, uh, we are independent. Uh, our sources of funding come from very different uh, parts. Uh, and, and when we publish the results, our goal is to, uh, to promote the dialogue. After the results are published, we engage in several conversations with civil society organizations, with governments, international organizations, and so on, to go deeper on the results. We don't go into the specifics of why are the results this way, 
but simply, I mean, not why in terms of, of what policies is the government doing or not doing, for example, or society is, is doing, uh, but simply just going into why the country supports just based on the specific questions, but we don't go any further on to the, the causes of those specific uh, sports. Uh, the reception over the years, I mean, we usually it's published in the main newspapers of the country, so over the years this has been published in about 3,000 news outlets. And it is very useful to, uh, to, to set, in many cases, a different conversations. So the power of indicators is that it allows to, to highlight certain issues that in some cases were not obvious. Uh, we have had situations, for example, in which policymakers use this to highlight particular areas in which the country is, is uh, has weaknesses that everybody knows, but they didn't know how bad it was. So, yes, we know that there is corruption, but how bad is it, is it really the problem? Have we been improving over the years or not? Right? Uh, examples in which the comparison countries were not really the right countries. So, one example, uh, Canada, for example, has been comparing on access to justice for several years compared against the United States. But it turns out that one of the weaknesses of the United States is access to justice. So they have been comparing to a country that in which the access to justice is not is not the the the, the strongest point. So so then with the indicators they were able to compare and to look at European countries and to start an agenda on access to justice, for example. So so this is just more or less how the the the, the index has been used either uh, I mean, in some cases, it has been used to raise some particular efforts of, of countries and so on. And, and it is used as well, just not only by countries, but by civil society to raise funds or by international organizations to understand just how the countries are, uh, are doing. Uh, so I will uh, just uh, leave probably uh, just uh, be allowed to talk about the specific results for, for Pakistan. Uh, and we have been doing this work in Pakistan for several years, so we are able to collect information over the different years and see just how uh, this has changed over the years. The difference in the report that you are going to see is that we go deeper than just simply aggregate indicators and try to show the specific response, uh, responses from the public, which in many cases are much more meaningful than just an aggregate indicator and are easier to track in many changes, how these changes over time, just with a greater confidence uh, and ideally used to uh, just to inform policy and inform the discussion. Thank you very much just for, for the invitation and for organizing this again for your preference. And with that, I'll, I'll just leave the room to, to Ilan. Thank you so much. And now we would move on to um, the results of the of the of the rule of law report and uh, the survey results. Uh, so basically, uh, the agenda of my presentation would be that I start with a uh, note of thanks and we discuss the main questions that the report talks about and the key findings uh, of the report, very brief methodology and then you open the floor for discussion. Um, it, it, I'd like to thank Dr. Uh, Bonds and uh, the World Justice Project team who have been very uh, open to uh, making the, the results public and having a discussion and uh, I mean also being available on short notice to participate in the survey uh, dis dissemination event. Um, we, my understanding would be that the survey is also an exercise to provide the voice to the voiceless. Um, so the rule of law and the legal system and uh, these kind of debates happen um, in the elite circles. So the elites talk about what the legal system is and what it, short, what it ought to be. So a survey is an exercise to provide voice to the people who live in rural areas, to far-fetched villages, and what is their understanding of how the rule of law in the country is. 
So when the elite talk about uh, about the rule of law, that's that's the elite's opinion. But the survey is an exercise to go to uh, make the the voiceless be heard here. Um, the um, Gallup has been working in Pakistan for about 35 years, and what we try to do is to build a case for a more empirical understanding of Pakistan. Um, so we, we've been doing ma many exercises as the one that we're doing today in order to put data into the public sphere so that the understanding of Pakistan and its problem in Pakistan and society is more based on numbers, uh, most, more nuanced understanding rather than being on hunches. Uh, so this is this seminar is broadly uh, under that light, under that program that we do, what we call as the Gallup History Project. Um, the main objective of the session is both to understand the results that I'm going to be presenting, uh, but the results are dense. Uh, it's a very large report. There, are, as Dr. Pons was saying, there are many uh, hundred variables being talked about. So the uh, I lay out the brief uh, results of the of the report and then open the floor for discussion. Uh, but then our, what we want to do is to continue this discussion in later forums as well, uh, so that there is a community of people who, can, who would like to uh, do further work on understanding rule of law in Pakistan. Uh, the main questions in the report that uh, we could understand was, were, were 11. There were 11 key themes uh, that the, re the report talks about. And what I have done is that we, we, there are the two major types of, of those indicators. There are seven indicators which are perception-based indicators. So the researchers went into uh, to conduct the survey and they asked what the population thought about them. So they were not largely they were they, they're not experience-based indicators. These these are perception of the people about rule of law, about corruption, about accountability. So there are seven perception-based indicators, and then there are four indicators which are based on experience. So, for example, how many people actually paid a bribe? How many people were were uh, were subjected to a crime like bribe, uh, like uh, uh, like theft or robbery? Uh, how many people encountered disputes uh, in the country, and how their experience with the criminal justice system was? Um, so, the the, the seven perception-based indicators uh, I briefly list them down. The first one is about perception of government accountability, and it talks about the the, the survey question is what would happen uh, if a high-ranking government officer is caught embezzling funds. Um, in order to understand uh, the, the the impunity of the government from any prosecution, uh, the second one looks at the corruption across institutions. So we ask perception of people about uh, corruption across institutions like police and then the the uh, magistrates. The third uh, theme uh, asks about bribery and uh, how many people have had to pay bribe to get things done. Uh, the fourth theme looks at the perception on freedoms in Pakistan, um, for example, political or media or religious freedoms. Um, the fifth uh, one is on the crimes uh, that people may have been subjected to, for example, it asks if people have had been subjected to burglary in the past three years, or armed robbery, or murder in the last three years, and what the people's responses were. Uh, it asks about people's experience of the criminal justice system, for example, asking about criminal investigative services and how their experience was, or uh, their understanding of what the problems with the criminal courts of the country were. Uh, the seventh indicator is general question about legal awareness, so how, how, how aware are people about their rights or rights of other people in the society. Um, the eighth team looks at dispute resolution, um, and it also charts down what sort of disputes do people actually face in the, in, in the country. So it's, it's in, in some sense it's also a need assessment of the legal system, to what extent people are, uh, I mean, I mean, simple issues like neighbor disputes to water disputes. So how, how, how much, how often does, uh, do those disputes happen? And then when those disputes happen, where do they go or uh, where do people go for resolution? And then when they go to a particular resolution mechanism, how their experience is. So it tracks the journey of dispute across uh, the, the resolution journey. Uh, the ninth issue looks at the women in Pakistani society and their overall perception about women rights and women issues and uh, 
the tenth theme looks at overall trust in Pakistan and trust in other uh, institutions, including the judiciary and the court and the police. Um, and the 11th one looks at the governance priorities in Pakistan. So these are 11 indicators that the report is comprised of. The survey questionnaire was about 50 questions, but it narrows down into these, three, these 11 uh, themes. 